Well, brothers and sisters, we are continuing our series on the Gospel of Mark, and today we are into chapter 4 of that series. Uh, We do have a long way to go, and uh, what we may do is we um, we may pause where we are and jump ahead Uh, to the days, uh, we may jump ahead to the Good Friday and Easter story for Good Friday and Easter. In fact, not may, we will. So, but for today, we are still on chapter four of the Gospel of Mark, and we are speaking today, we are are learning today about how Jesus uh, talks to his disciples throughout this chapter in different ways, basically about shining your light, the light of the gospel given to you by Christ in this dark world. And so we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, But as you read, uh, as you hear the passage of Mark chapter 4, keep in mind and ask yourself, how is this portion of this chapter about sharing the good news with others um, in the way that God has given me to do. All right, chapter 4. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that had gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching he said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell among the rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown in rocking places, hear the word at once and receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. 
Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He, he did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters, this, this section of the Gospel of Mark has a number of different parables, and parables can be a little bit tricky for us to deal with. And so we're going to have to unpack some of uh, the details in these parables in order to understand precisely what it was that Jesus was trying to say to his disciples and to us, of course. Now, first of all, while we do that, while we unpack some of those details, keep in mind that a lot of this is essentially about you and I, about Christ followers, about Jesus' disciples, about uh, not just the 12, but all of his disciples sharing the light of the good news, the gospel that Jesus is bringing to them. And so keep that in mind as you think uh, about these things. Now, uh, the first parable, of course, is the parable of the sower. That's what we call it. And this parable, I love this parable for a really particular reason that, that sticks home with me. And I am very grateful to uh, Martin Spoolstra, who is the pastor at Discovery Church in Bowmanville. I think he's the one who uh, first alerted me to this. I had never thought about it before. I don't know where he got it from, but I got it from him. And that is that the, the reality of this parable is how indiscriminate the sower is, right? How, how the sower scatters his seeds everywhere without seeming a whole lot of care as to where they go. Often in this parable, we focus on the reality of asking ourselves, you know, the question of, ooh, has this seed landed among good soil or, or bad soil? Am I uh, in good soil or bad soil? Am I being choked out by life's worries and, and so on, right? We, we focus on that aspect of things. But the reality is, if we say that the farmer is like Jesus, yes, but also the farmer is like all of his disciples. He is called, the farmer, to spread the seed of the gospel. Then it is important to notice that the farmer doesn't worry particularly about where he throws his seed. 
Now, this is not like our farmers, I don't think, <laughs> right? Our farmers carefully make sure that the soil that they have is going to be the best soil that they can get. Now, it's not always perfect, and, and we know, especially in this area, that, that some parts of, of the same field have nice, thick soil, and other parts of that same field have just a thin, thin layer of soil because the, the Canadian shield pops up right almost to the surface. Or other parts of the, the soil are in a bowl that's formed by rocks, by granite, and, and so it never drains properly, and so the crops run into trouble there. But as best they can, the farmers around here, as far as I know, they prepare the soil as, as, as much as is possible, and they plant their crops in the best places they can, right? Whereas this farmer, and I believe God, is calling us in a like manner to scatter the seeds everywhere, the seeds of the gospel. Now, will all of those seeds bear fruit? No, no, obviously not. Some are, are going to never get the gospel at all, really. Right? Uh, some are going to get the gospel, but, but they, it doesn't stick with them. They don't, it just goes away. It drops out because they, they don't have the roots that they need. Uh, others are going to be, are going to be, they're going to start out with the best of intentions, but the worries of this world are going to choke out the gospel message in their lives. They're going to be consumed by things and worries and, and, and all those things. But some seeds will land on the good soil and those will produce, and that is good. But ours is not really to worry about what soil the seed will go in. Even if it was, if it was our worry, we'd be in trouble because we would probably pick the wrong people, just like the disciples did, right? The disciples grew up in a society where, for example, richness, wealth, was an indicator of God's favor, and, and, and disability or, or crippling or, or disease was a symbol of God's disfavor. And so if it were probably up to them before they finally understood the gospel, they would have evangelized to the wealthy people and they would have left the sick and the sinful and the sorrowful alone, which is almost precisely opposite of what Jesus did. And who's to say that we would be any different? And even if we were different, if we only sent the gospel to the, to the poor and the needy and the sick and the sorrowing and, and neglected the, the wealthy altogether, that would also be terrible and a horrible mistake. So remember that. Now, also, as you go along, you see, you know, Jesus explains that parable and it's pretty clear. It lines up, I think, pretty well with what we've just talked about. But then he goes on to the parable of a lamp on a stand. And this is where, where we get the idea for this message about how it, it, it's really this chapter is in large part about shining your light in this world, right? Do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? No, of course not, right? God is bringing us a light in Jesus Christ and kindling a flame, the flame of the Holy Spirit within our lives. And so we can shine that out, not keep it hidden. Now, it's interesting. It's interesting because Jesus here challenges some things that are often struggles for us. Jesus here is sort of talking about how 
we ought to let the light of the gospel shine out in our lives. But we're often pretty shy about that. Just like we're shy about very things that are very personal and, and vulnerable for us. I think maybe I've mentioned this before, but I don't remember. Uh, but maybe some of you can identify with this. I sometimes paint paintings or do drawings. I haven't done it nearly as much as I should or, or would like to. I also sometimes write things like creative writing sort of things. Um, and, and I really struggle to share that with people sometimes because I think because pour so much of my heart into those things, and they're so important to me, and I realize that they would be so easy to criticize, and for someone to say something to me about them, absolutely devastating, that I, that I struggle to share them. I'm afraid of what people will say. I'm afraid of what their reaction will be. I'm afraid of what they will do. But Jesus says, consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has been given more, uh, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they will have will be taken from them. And Sorry, before that, it says, For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. That's verse 22. And whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. And see, when you put that together with verse 24 and 25, what Jesus is really saying, is how you dole out, how you measure out the most important things in your life, the things that are hidden in your heart, the things that are most sensitive, the things that are most vulnerable, the things that you treasure so deeply you're afraid to let people know about them, the measure that you use in giving those things out to others is what God will use and others will use to discern who you are and will measure out to you. Hmm. So, an example. With my paintings, or my art, my writing, Jesus is saying that if I open up my heart to share that sensitive and delicate and vulnerable place with others, that is extremely generous. And I'm not bragging because I, I struggle to do it. Right? Jesus is saying that kind of vulnerability and honesty is precious and generous when given to others. And so if you have been generous, if I have been generous with the most deep and secret and delicate and vulnerable parts of our souls if we have been generous with that, then God and others will be generous with us. That's what it means when Jesus says those, whatever you measure, with the measure, excuse me, you use, it will be measured to you and even more. So right there, Jesus pokes pretty strongly at the idea that my faith or your faith or any Christ follower's faith can be something that is personal and private and not shared 
with others. Now, does that mean that everyone's light will shine in exactly the same way? Are we all destined to go out and become professional missionaries? Or are we all destined to go out and become televangelists or YouTubers sharing the gospel out loud and, and in, the, in the public setting, the public forum, forum among crowds of thousands of people? Is that what Jesus is saying? No, no not at all. Jesus is not saying that. There can be lamps that are, that are little lamps, little candles that just shine a little bit of light. And there are great, huge honking floodlights that light up the night sky for miles and miles around. There's the sun, for goodness sake, that lights up the whole solar system and beyond for countless light years can be seen. There are so many different lights. Each person will have a different light. But you and me, in our light, how we share the vulnerability and the truth of the gospel and the importance of Jesus Christ in our lives and who he is for us and what God has meant for us, how we share that will be a guide for how God will treat us. Now, I skipped a parable by accident when I was reading. I don't know why I did this. I don't know. Um, not on purpose. Anyways, we missed reading the parable of the growing seed, verse 26 to 29. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or get up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And then we move on to the parable of the mustard seed, right? And we talk about how uh, in both of those stories, both of those parables, the gospel grows into something significant without necessarily us understanding or even being a part of the whys or the hows, right? The parable of the sower, the sower goes out to sow his seeds. The parable of the growing seed, the, the farmer sows his seed again, and it comes up without the farmer really knowing fully what is going on. And it, it's true today, too. Now, our farmers have a very good understanding of the biology of what's happening and, and so on. But that being said, they have very little control, ultimately, over what actually ends up happening with those seeds. The rain may be too much one year, the sun too much another year, the temperature's too low, the temperature's too high. There, there could be drought or there could be locusts. I don't think we get locusts around here, but there could be some sort of blight that comes and the farmer will do the best that he can to make sure that things go well, but ultimately it's really out of the farmer's hands. So too with us. But yet, as we share the gospel, God miraculously works through his Holy Spirit to make that seed grow. And sometimes it grows from a tiny, tiny seed, you don't know what you said that made anything happen there, into something so, so beautiful. A little example, sort of. My dad taught physics for uh, like 45 years, I don't know, a long time in the public school system. And, and much of that time, he was teaching senior level physics courses. And there was one particular student that he came across. I mean, he taught hundreds of students, right? But one particular student that he talked with 
years down the road, came and said thank you to him for his teaching because it had inspired him to go into physics for a profession. Now, I doubt that my dad could pinpoint exactly what it was that he said that inspired this young man to become a physicist. But nonetheless, that seed that was planted, regardless of how small it was, grew into something big and beautiful. So, too, it is with us and shining our light, no matter how small it may be. What matters is the generosity of the giving of ourselves and the most important thing to us. And then what God does with it is miracle beyond miracle. Last but not least in this chapter, we come to the story of Jesus calming the storm. You might think that this is unrelated to the previous stories. After all, we're not talking about seeds, and we're not talking about lights, and we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about, uh, yeah, seeds or lights. Right? We're not talking about either one of those things, and it's just a journey from one place to another. However, there is a key there. Jesus says to his disciples, after he has calmed the storm, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, pay attention, because this is a hard saying. What Jesus is saying there is that the reality is that those disciples in those boats who were being swamped by a terrible storm, a furious squall, they should not have been afraid. That's scary. Why should they not have been afraid? Well, they should not have been afraid because they should have had faith in Jesus. They should have known that either they would get safely across to the other side, or they would drown and die, but regardless, it would be fine. What? Regardless, it would be fine. This is, this is Christian weirdness, and I love it. It is so important. It doesn't matter whether we live or die. Either way, it's okay. It's going to work out well. Why? Why? Because we believe the Heidelberg Catechism when it summarizes scriptures and says that my only comfort in life and in death is that I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter whether I'm alive or dead. Doesn't matter, right? We believe the scriptures when Jesus says, do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? And, and here's the kicker. What that means is that all of this about sharing vulnerably the most important things in our hearts and minds and souls and bodies, the most important things with other people in a vulnerable way, it doesn't matter whether we are laughed at, whether we are hurt, whether we are persecuted, whether we are slammed for our faith. It doesn't matter whether we die for that faith. It does not matter. 
Why? Because we have faith in Jesus. When he promises that he works all things to the good of those who love him, he's not joking. He's including death. So, wrap this up in a package. Jesus says throughout chapter 4 that we are called to sow the seeds, to shine the light, of the gospel wherever we go. We don't have to understand how it happens, although it's great for us to stand in awe of what God does with that gospel sowing. We know that sometimes it won't work out too well, and sometimes it'll be incredible. And that whatever happens, it happens if it is good through the working of the Holy Spirit in people's lives, and not us. But we also know that the generosity with which we give the deepest things of our heart, that generosity will be used as a measure back for us. So, brothers and sisters, Are you afraid of sharing Jesus with others? Are you afraid like I'm afraid to share my art or my writing? If you are, and you do share anyway, That is good. God is so glad for your faithfulness. Carry on. If you don't, because you're afraid, find some small step. Find some big step. Find some way to share your deepest heart with someone soon. Take this step. Be bold. Be courageous. Don't be afraid, for God will work it to your good. And if you don't share and you're not afraid, then please poke around and ask yourself do you really care? Is Jesus actually important to you? Because if you're not afraid and you don't share, we need to ask ourselves the question, why? Brothers and sisters, remember that somewhere along the line, if you know Jesus and you love Jesus, someone shared with you the most important thing in their life. They shared generously with you even a small thing. Let us do no less. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your, for your word in the gospel of Mark. Lord, thank you so much for your challenge to us to share the deepest things of our hearts. Thank you so much, O oh God, that you sent your son Jesus to share with us the deepest things of his heart. Oh God, guide us.
that we may sow the seeds of your gospel, that we may shine the light of your gospel among the people with whom we come in contact, the people that you bring to us. Guide us, O God. And Lord, may we never forget how you, through through the Holy Spirit, inspired somebody else to share with us that gospel message somewhere along the line, maybe many times along the line. Lord God, may we be encouraged that you have made our seed grow, that you have made us into a mustard plant big enough for birds to nest in, that you have made us into grain that can be fruitful 30 or 60 or 100 times more. Lord, may we live as fruitful grain. May we live as mustard plants. May we live unafraid. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.